That's right. Most therapists uh, uh, have a great deal of difficulty identifying the function yeah. of a voice. So the example you gave is, is an excellent one, and that is self-harm. Hey guys, uh, welcome to an all new episode of Insights, a scientific talk show, which by now I hope is your favorite. And uh, I know uh, it's been a while since the last episode, but we have a great guest uh, in, this, in this new series of episodes. And uh, here is Dr. David Barlow with me. Uh, Dr. Barlow received his PhD from the University of Vermont in 1969 and has published over 650 articles and chapters and over 90 books and clinical manuals, mostly in the areas of anxiety and related emotional disorders, sexual problems, and clinical research methodology. He is formerly professor of psychiatry at the University of Mississippi Medical Center and professor of psychiatry and psychology at Brown University and founded clinical psychology internships in both settings. He was also distinguished professor in the Department of Psychology at the University at Albany State University of New York. He joined Boston University in 1996. He is past president of the Division of Clinical Psychology of the American Psychological Association, past president of the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies, and was a member of the DSM IV Task Force of the American Psychiatric Association. So, uh, Dr. Barlow, I'm so honored uh, to have you here and that we can talk a little bit about some issues regarding uh, clinical psychology. How are you? I'm fine, thank you, and thank you very much for having me, Mauricio. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much. So uh, maybe before uh, going into the psychology questions, uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you came to the to the field and uh, how you became interested in, in the study of emotional disorders, anxiety, and uh, neuroticism. <laughs> Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, well, it goes back many years, as you can tell, <laughs> uh, before probably most listeners were born. But uh, in the 1960s, when I was a student, um, I knew that I was always very interested in why people behaved the way they did. Um, I was particularly interested, and I came to this through reading literature. I was first an English major, a, a literature major, uh, great books and uh, novels and fiction. And uh, there was a, at the time, this was the 1960s, a popular thing to do was to apply the prevailing uh, psychoanalytic concept to literary characters. Uh, for example, psychoanalyzing Hamlet in Shakespeare. Yeah. You know, it was things like that. And strange as it may seem, I was very interested in that. And that's how I get into the field. I was very interested in, again, uh, behavior, why people did the things they did. And what I later came to find out was called the neurotic paradox. And this was the term originated by a psychologist named Maurer back in the 1940s, and it basically posed the problem. Why do reasonably intelligent, rational people <laughs> continue to engage, engage in behavior that on the face of it is hurtful to them, self-destructive to them, does not help them advance their goals? When any reasonable person, uh, you know, just applying laws of reason would take the more rational course. So the most simple explanation was somebody with a phobia of flying in airplanes. Yeah. So there are many brilliant um, executives and professionals that we have treated over the years who whose careers have been held back because they are unable to get on an airplane 
and fly to the next meeting or the next uh, uh, business uh, uh, convention or uh, to see customers. And these are people who know perfectly well, rationally, that flying is the safest way to travel. It's much more dangerous to take your car and drive 100 miles, you know, than it is to take an airplane statistically. <clears throat> and yet, despite knowing that, being rationally aware of that fact, they are unable to get on the plane and they continue to engage in this self defeating behavior. That's the neurotic paradox. And that's the simplest example. But if you take that and extend it to all aspects of your life, your relationships, uh, your work habits, your uh, leisure time uh, pursuits, yeah. then you see you get, uh, uh, and, and some of that behavior, when it goes to extremes, then we have what we call psychopathology or um, you know emotional disorders. And I was always interested in that. And so at a very early age, just to, I mean, you know, back in the 60s, <clears throat> when I looked at the prevailing ways that were available to help people, it was almost always long-term psychoanalysis. Yeah. And yet when you look closely um, at that process, it became clear there was no evidence that it worked. There was no evidence that actually helped people. Yeah. Some people enjoyed the process, you know, of meeting every week for years on end and talking to a, you know, supportive therapist. But there was no evidence that anyone really benefited in terms of the problems that they were having. Yeah. So, uh, so that's when I became interested in are there possibly ways we could do a better job? Hey, and so that's when you came into the, well, became interested in, in finding evidence about different approaches that could actually help people and, well, and more in the in the long term, right? Because that's that's always a problem with psychoanalysis, these long-term uh, treatment protocols. I, I mean, not protocols, but treatment. Uh, yeah, regimens. Yeah. yeah, just a long-term course of treatment, often taking two or three years. Yeah. Okay, so uh, that's that's great to hear. And maybe now that we're talking about psychopathology, uh, I mean, I, I think most of the students that that are hearing us are familiar with uh, your textbook, Abnormal Psychology. And I think it has a, a very interesting subtitle, which is an integrative approach. And I would like to ask you, uh, why is it important to to take an integrative approach to psychopathology? Uh, right. Well, it's in our field of psychology, psychiatry, and psychopathology, there are there is so much um, so many so many approaches that basically become popular or become a fad uh, because occasionally it might seem that the person's getting better yeah. when you use these techniques. So the problem really is that particularly with emotional disorders, and that's anxiety and depressive disorders and related disorders, obsessive compulsive disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder. With all of these disorders, there can be a strong placebo effect. Yeah. And what that means is that if we take panic disorder, for example, and that's a very common disorder, many people suffer from panic attacks. Yeah. But there are and there are a large number of people who go on go on to develop panic disorder. Now, panic attacks are a very normal part of living. Many of us under stress occasionally have a panic attack. But um, most of us are able to be resilient 
and say, oh my God, what was that? I must be working too hard, or maybe it's something I ate. In other words, they demonstrate some uh, resilient cognitive appraisals, and they do not develop a disorder. Yeah. But there are some people who have a neurotic temperament to begin with, who have a panic attack, and then say, oh my God, and they think the worst. They say, I must be dying, or going crazy, yeah. or uh, they're going to come and take me away to the hospital. Uh, and they become mortally afraid of having their next panic attack. So um, the pathology is not that they're having panic attacks, because that's a normal kind of occurrence in 30 or 40 percent of the population. Yeah. The pathology, or what's wrong with them, is that they become extremely anxious about having the next attack. Yeah. And that's what has to be treated. But the thing is, when you treat these people, it's initially, and this is true for depression as well, is very susceptible initially to placebo effects. So you could do almost anything for a couple of sessions, and 30 or 40 percent of the patients would show some improvement. But in our field, as you know, we call that a correlated finding rather than a causal relationship. It doesn't mean that what you were doing in treatment was responsible for the change. Yes. Uh, and so they relapse. So they return, you know, they, they ultimately don't get better. But because, <clears throat> you know, there is this uh, phenomenon of placebo effects where you could ask somebody to stand on their head, you know, every morning for uh, 15 minutes and see how that works. And 30 or 40 percent would say, oh, I feel much better. When in yeah. fact, a couple of weeks later, they'll be, you know, back to their old self. So because of that, there's a lot of fads that develop. Therapists begin trying this out. And they find, oh, that seems to work in a few patients. I think I'll keep doing it soon. And multiply that times a thousand. We have all these sort of faddish treatments or interventions without any evidence, without any good evidence that they work. Yeah. So we discovered that. So in the 60s, there were no evidence-based treatments. There was nothing that was uh, firmly based on evidence to treat psychopathology. So in the late 60s and 70s, with the advent of cognitive therapy and behavior therapy, we began to actually put some of these procedures to the test. Yeah. Now, what really works? And, of course, the first thing we found out is that exposure treatment, where you take, for example, someone with a flying phobia, mm -hmm. and you actually gradually expose them to the cues uh, concerning flying, such as getting ready for the flight and uh, going up a hierarchy. This is in the 70s now. And finally, even getting on a plane, there were many times I would get on a plane with a patient and we'd fly to the next city and then I'd fly back with them. Uh, you know, that would be the final step. But, you know, we discovered uh, that applying that to phobias and then eventually to other anxiety-based disorders actually worked. And patients learned, these individuals learned at an emotional level in yeah. their emotional brain, what they knew rationally, and that is that flying was not dangerous. So that was the beginning of it. Yeah, and, and, and I think something that is very important uh, when when trying to develop uh, an actually efficient approach for treating uh, any, any uh, behavioral or psychological disorder is uh, of course, we want the evidence about it uh, that it works, that there is a causal relation, as as you 
as you mentioned. But I think uh, it is also very important to be aware or try at least to find the mechanisms, the processes that are responsible for these changes, because this will lead to, to the development of more uh, effective treatments. Yes, that's absolutely correct. And so <clears throat> as time went by in the 1970s and the 1980s, we discovered that first exposure therapies were then we discovered that cognitive therapy also was effective. And that means, you know, working on the kinds of attributions and appraisals that patients have about their, uh, you know, difficult situation. Again, to take the simple example of flying, the uh, phobic patient will say, oh my God, uh, when the airplane makes a certain noise, that means it's about to crash and we're all going to die. Yeah. You know, whereas anybody else who gets on a plane and hears the various noises that occur when a plane flies, say, oh, that's just part of the equipment and that's a normal uh, occurrence. So those appraisals, you know, we had to, based on the pioneering work of Dr. Aaron Beck, the great cognitive therapist, you know, we had to dig into those appraisals and attributions that were based on emotion rather than reason and pick them apart and say, well, what's the evidence that would happen? And what's another possible interpretation of hearing those uh, funny sounds when a, when a plane takes off? Mm -hmm. And so we found that that worked. But then, as you point out, along with exposure and cognitive therapy, the next step is why do they work? What's the mechanism? And so for the past several decades, many of us around the world have been uh, looking at that. <clears throat> and we discovered for emotional disorders something very interesting. And that is that if you take... Uh, the anxiety disorder, maybe social anxiety disorder, where people are afraid to go to speak in front of a large group of people or even go to a party where they have to interact with a bunch of people or any of the anxiety disorders. Um, for years, we would expose them to the social situations gradually. All right, maybe you could just speak to one person sitting in front of you. Yeah. Then you could pretend there's a larger group, then you could speak to a larger group, uh, et cetera. But, and then we would deal with their, what they were thinking and what they were doing, uh, that they weren't avoiding it. But what we began to find out in the 1980s was, you know, it wasn't so much the situation itself that was the problem. Oh, yes, it triggered their anxiety and panic, but it didn't really, it wasn't the fundamental cause. What really seemed to be happening is that these individuals were, became very anxious because they were unable to tolerate very intense emotion. It was the emotion itself. It was the intense emotion itself that they found very threatening and very dangerous. So all of these individuals, whether it was post-traumatic stress disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and even depression, yeah. uh, what they were often doing is engaging in behavior and thinking that would avoid feeling these intense emotions, no matter what the trigger. Yeah. Because uh, most people, you know, aren't uh, initially totally comfortable going into a room full of strange people mm -hmm. that they've never met. That's a normal reaction. But we have, most of us have the confidence, well, we'll go in and we'll meet some people and they'll be friendly and, and ultimately that's what you do. But somebody with social anxiety says, oh my God, 
They're going to uh, think I'm ugly. They're going to, I won't be able to get words out. I'll begin perspiring and uh, I'll make a fool of myself. And, and they bring on, you know, they have very, very intense, strong emotion accompanying that. But again, what we're finding out is that that emotion and the associated negative thoughts, that was the, that was the uh, problem and that they're avoiding that intense emotion. So what we began doing in the 1990s was actually exposing them to the emotion itself, Mm -hmm. the very intense emotions of fear, anxiety, depression, et cetera. And interestingly, we discovered that even if the emotions are very positive, like, uh, you know, uh, excitement. Yeah. Or extreme, uh, you know, overwhelming joy or something. To our patients who are very neurotic to begin with, that's just as threatening. Yeah. So we discovered early on, for example, there were patients with panic disorder who could not go to the airport to greet their relatives coming home to visit. Maybe yeah. their son, maybe their children, adult children coming home to visit because they were afraid they would become so emotional that they would have uh, an episode, a panic attack, or a breakdown. So they would avoid it. So even positive emotion, um, if they're too intense, they're interpreted that is the sort of a kind of cognitive set. The psychopathology is that. Oh, I may lose control, and that will mean I'll go crazy, or I might have a heart attack, die, even if it's a pleasant emotion. So we discovered that mechanism, and we spent a lot of time, many people around the world, coming up with treatments to target that neurotic core. Yeah, and, and I think that uh, uh, what you just told us is uh, very important because uh, we tend maybe... Uh, at least here, uh, one of the most prominent uh, evidence-based approaches is uh, behavior analysis. And uh, we're typically used to thinking about uh, panic responses or anxiety responses as just the uh, the conditioned response. Yeah? And the uh, evitative, uh, not, uh, it's not evitative, the word, I think. It's avoidance. Avoidance. Yeah. As, uh, as this operand that causes problems to the to the clients, but uh, you're you're telling us that actually uh, the appraisal of the emotion and the uh, experience of the emotion is something that is uh, very important, and moreover, it's it's common among many of these emotional disorders. Yes, and what happens is where the avoidance comes in mm-hmm. is that they then avoid experiencing that intense emotion. So taking a behavioral analytic approach, yeah. you know, we look carefully at, at all of our patients uh, and see in what ways are they avoiding feeling intense emotions. And of course, uh, Steve Hayes, who developed uh, Acceptance and commitment therapy, as you know, mm-hmm. was one of my students at one at one point many years ago. Yeah. And so we worked on some of these things uh, together, and he has done a wonderful job, you know, of of uh, incorporating some of these principles into ACT yes. uh, therapy. Uh, the program we developed is called the Unified Protocol, and again. It gets at the same notion. What are people doing to avoid feeling strong emotion? Mm-hmm. Can we uh, prevent that avoidance and engage in some exposure to this intense emotion so that patients will learn emotionally that actually there are no negative consequences? The yeah. feeling of intense emotion. And in Steve Hayes' procedure, that's called acceptance and, and, and commitment to more positive uh, values. Uh, 
But we look at the many different kinds of avoidance. Some of it's so subtle that many patients are not aware of it. So, yes. you know, it will be the subtle behavioral avoidance. To take a, a common example, and it shows you how pervasive this is, is one of the, uh, you know, very popular strategies these days, particularly in students, uh, is to give people trigger warnings. So the notion will be, if there's any, if you're teaching or giving a lecture, and there's any uh, material coming up that might be upsetting, then you should inform people of this, inform the students, say, what I'm going to say now is very upsetting, or can be upsetting to some people, and you need to be aware of it. Well, there's been, that, that is an avoidance procedure. What you're telling, what you're telling everybody is don't become, don't let anything upset you, you know, because becoming upset is very potentially dangerous. Yeah. You could be traumatized by it. Well, that's exactly the wrong method from a behavioral point of view. You know, from an act point of view, from any psychological point of view, that's the wrong message to give. The message to give is that you're going to encounter a lot of upsetting things in your life. People are going to say things that may be hurtful. You're going to experience a rejection and uh, uh, various sorts of things. But what needs to happen is you need to develop procedures to be resilient. You need to be able to have coping procedures to handle becoming upset, maybe becoming emotional, uh, experiencing bad things, etc. So we have evidence, for example, from distinguished scholars like Richard McNally at Harvard mm -hmm. and uh, others showing that trigger warnings don't do any good. They're not effective. In other words, if you give one group trigger warning and a second group you don't give trigger warning, there's no difference whatsoever in how upset they are by subsequent material. In fact, if anything, it might make things a little worse. So, but that's an example of the pervasiveness of emotional avoidance that is at the heart of, in some people, who are vulnerable mm -hmm. to the development of uh, emotional disorders. Yeah, and I think uh, not only maybe our uh, clients not aware of subtle uh, avoidant behaviors, but I think also therapists sometimes struggle to identify this uh, avoidant function in some forms of behavior, like uh, maybe self-harm or... Uh, some kinds of thoughts like rumination or uh well uh, maybe maybe behaviors that are not as obviously avoidant as as just not showing up or as canceling a, a date for example yeah yes that's that's right most therapists uh, uh have a great deal of difficulty identifying the function yeah. of avoidance so the example you gave is is an excellent one, and that is self-harm. Uh, so there, there, you know, on, on, tragically, a number of people who engage in uh, self-harm behavior. The most common example would be cutting. Yeah, you know, they they cut their uh, cut themselves often in places where uh, you know it can't be seen, but they they uh, and you say, well. That can't be avoidance. I mean, that's what's wrong with them. There's something really fundamentally that it must be psychotic or something. But in yeah. fact, when you look closely at that, as you know, Mauricio, uh, from a behavioral analytic point of view, and you do a functional analysis, what you find is that immediately after these individuals cut, they experience a relief of intense emotion. It produces a period of, of uh, cessation of the intensity of the emotion. It relieves it. 
maybe because of the attraction of it, or maybe for some other reason. But because it accomplishes that very positive uh, function of relieving intense emotional distress, it becomes reinforced in a negative way, negative reinforcement, we call it. And uh, it perpetuates itself. Yeah. And so when we use, for example, our unified protocol to treat uh, self-harm behavior, um, you know, we actually have them, we actually uh, work with them to produce the kind of intense emotional distress they experience that ordinarily would lead to cutting, but of yeah. course prevent the avoidant behavior, which is cutting. So cutting is an avoidant behavior to yes. avoid intense emotional distress. Then we can give them some different techniques to deal with that and help them to greatly decrease the intensity of that uh, emotional avoidance. And since you mentioned the the unified protocol, which uh, maybe for for those who don't know, it's uh, the unified protocol for the transdiagnostic treatment of emotional disorders. Very good. Yeah. Uh, could you please uh, explain a little bit about about the the unified protocol uh, for for maybe some of the audience that maybe are new to the to the topic? Sure. Well, again, back in the eighties, <clears throat> when we began. 70, 1970s and 1980, when we began developing uh, more evidence-based approaches, um, one of the developments that was very interesting is that we began putting these treatments in manualized form. So there'd be a manual, or a small book for the therapist to follow, and maybe a workbook to give the patient. And so the first one we developed was for panic disorder mm -hmm. back in the 1980s. And we had our Michelle Kraft and I, uh, Michelle Kraft at UCLA. And we developed, uh, and we had the workbook and the therapist guide for applying our new treatments for panic disorder. And this was useful because it was an evidence-based treatment and yet therapists could accept it. And there'd be training programs on how to use it. And this was all very, very uh, popular at the time. And um, these books were widely distributed. But then, because of our diagnostic system, uh, it turned out that, well, if your main problem was generalized anxiety disorder, we needed another book, another manual. If it was obsessive compulsive disorder, yep, we had treatments for that. That was another manual. Depression, yet another manual, et cetera. And as you know, it went on and on, and these manuals proliferated and increased yes. in number. It came harder and harder. How does a therapist, you know, working every day treating patients, how do they choose? Keep up with this <laughs> never ending. Never uh, ending. How do, which one do they choose? And then, you know, after our manual for panic disorder, then another one appeared that was slightly different, but really the same program. Then a third one. Pretty soon there were 20 manuals for treating panic disorder. And when you look at them, they're all pretty much the same. They each had their twist, you know, their little uh, feature. And by the way, the same thing happens with drugs. You know, when the pharmaceutical companies, the drug companies, yeah. When they develop a new drug, let's say an antidepressant, like the old tricyclic antidepressants, and they get some some efficacy, you know, some there's some evidence that it's effective. Pretty soon there's twenty different uh, antidepressants that are basically the same molecule or very close. Yeah. So there's this proliferation of, you know, there's nothing really new proliferation. And then once in a while <clears throat> Once in a while, there's a breakthrough, and it, you know the SSRIs come along, and then there's 20 or 30, or, and so on. And the same thing happens in psychological treatment. So there'd be all these manuals. <clears throat> in the 90s, in the late 80s and 90s, uh, in the 90s in particular, 1990s, it seemed to me that all of these 
treatment for the emotional disorders, again, anxiety, depression, <clears throat> traumatic symptom disorders, etc., PTSD. The treatments had more in common than they did uh, things that made them different. What were those common elements? You know, and we began um, doing the kind of mechanism work that we just talked about and found out it was all of these disorders had in common the fact that these patients are experiencing intense emotion that they are then avoiding, either cognitively or behaviorally. Yeah. We said, well, rather than have a different, and the other thing was that all of these patients typically had more than one disorder. If they had panic disorder, they probably had generalized anxiety disorder, they might be depressed, maybe they had some OCD. So they were comorbid for a number of these disorders, which further, you know, gives evidence for the fact that these disorders have more in common than what makes them different. So we said maybe we should come up with a single set of change principles, of uh, therapeutic principles. Mm -hmm that would be applicable to all of these disorders. And we call it the unified protocol because it would take uh, what was important for any disorder and put them into one set of approximately five modules. And we call that the unified protocol for transdiagnostic treatment, in other words, across many diagnoses, of yes. emotional disorders. And emotional disorders, <clears throat> we wrote we wrote some papers describing just what is an emotional disorder, and those references are available. But it basically encompasses the old neurotic spectrum. Uh, back in the 60s, we used to say people had neurosis. Mm -hmm. That was a psychoanalytic concept. And there was this neurotic spectrum. And it encompassed every disorder except for psychotic disorders. Yes. Like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, uh, delusional disorder. So <clears throat> it really is, you know, very widely uh, uh, applicable. Uh, so that's what the unified protocol is. We also found that um, some, some people are doing this kind of research, particularly up here in Boston. Found that um, even people with psychotic disorders, like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, often have a very strong emotional component to the disorder, yeah. and that they can benefit from the unified protocol, uh, which, <clears throat> if administered properly, in addition to some medication. Uh, which are often necessary for someone with an intense psychotic disorder, mm -hmm. will greatly reduce the uh, process of relapse uh, in the months and years to come. So unified in that it contained a single set of principles and transdiagnostic and that is cut across, you know, all of the DSM diagnoses. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about maybe the this core principles that uh, that, <clears throat> that the UP encompasses? Yes. And again, uh, the UP, um, if, if you look at some of the other treatments that we're now learning are transdiagnostic, like ACT mm -hmm. uh, from uh, Hay, uh, Hay and his colleagues, or dialectical behavior therapy, from Marsha Lynn. That started out as a treatment for borderline personality disorder. Well, we have another paper where we say that's really an emotional disorder. Okay. It's not a personality disorder. It's an emotional disorder. In fact, it's the most severe emotional disorder. And Marsha Linehan did wonderful work, you know, coming up with some principles to treat that. Steve uh, developed, uh, you know, at based on extensive behavioral analytic work. So mm -hmm. what we find is that the unified protocol act in dialectical behavior therapy, just to take a few, are often working on very similar principles. 
And these principles are, in, in the unified protocol, what they are, the principles, is that first of all, we start with a session where we uh, educate the patient, you know, in a dialogue format on the nature of emotional disorder. What is it? What are emotions? What are you feeling? Uh, emotions can be very useful. They're a very important part of our life. You know, they're normal. Uh, in fact, there would be a big problem if you did not experience emotion. Yes. Uh, there are some people such as uh, what we call psychopaths, psychopathic personality. Their problem is they have no emotion. They have no anxiety, no guilt, no, no, uh, you know, so that's sort of, so emotions are normal. So that's one module, education about the nature of emotion. Mm -hmm. Your problem is, you know, the difficulty you're having is that you're experiencing very intense emotion very frequently, and you are trying to suppress it and avoid it. So we get that message across in a number of ways. <clears throat> then the next therapeutic uh, principle is that we look at their thinking. When they're having these intense emotions, what are they thinking? Mm -hmm. What are they telling themselves? And what they're telling themselves is that something catastrophic is going to happen. The worst is going to happen. Uh, the worst thing, I'm going to die, or I'm going to kill people, uh, whatever it is. And that the probability of that worst thing happening is almost certain. You know, so they're overestimating the probability and they're catastrophizing. So we work on the thinking. That's basically, you know, cognitive therapy, but we boil it down to those two cognitive areas. Then we work, we begin working on um, what they're feeling. So when they experience intense emotion, uh, there's a lot of physical manifestation of that. Their heart starts beating faster. Uh, their breathing may get more shallow. Um, they may begin to get hot and perspire a little bit. Um, when they, when patients with emotional disorders begin experiencing those symptoms, those physical manifestations of strong emotions, that scares them too. You know, they become very, very, uh, it, yeah. it cycles up. Yes. So we, we call, you know, that's because of what we call interoceptive conditioning. Mm -hmm. So we then introduce what we call interoceptive exposure. And we say, look, these are normal emotions. You know, if you were at football game, soccer, you know, football game, and it was coming down to the end of the game was very exciting and your team scored a goal, you yeah. know, at the end, you'd feel the same thing. Your heart would start racing. You'd feel really excited and pumped up and your face might get red. It said, the problem is not that you're having those feelings. The problem is the feelings are bothering you when you have strong emotions. So we expose them to those internal, those physiological sensations. We <clears throat> have them you know, exercise, run in place in the office and their heart rate goes up. We have them breathe through a straw and it gives the impression that they can't get enough oxygen, you know, like that's what happened if they were running. Yeah. Uh, et cetera. So that's the third. And then the fourth part of it is we look at all of their other avoidance, all of their behavioral avoidance of things that they're, and their subtle behavioral avoidance and cognitive avoidance, and we prevent that. And we put it all together and have them encounter whatever it is that's triggering their strong emotions or their depression or anxiety, and have them put these new coping mechanisms into play where instead of avoiding, they actually welcome uh, uh, and accept and learn to tolerate and uh, react differently to the strong emotions. So that's the core of the unified protocol. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, I mean, there is there is recently been some debate among uh, some, well, uh, 
various psychologists from the uh, Spanish speaking population about uh, whether it's uh, it's important to have uh, like disorder specific specialization or whether uh, a transdiagnostic approach is better. Uh, what do we know about uh, our, our transdiagnostic approaches as as effective as specific disorder uh, protocols? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. And that's something we've been uh, researching, doing a lot of research on lately. So in one of our trials, one of our clinical trials where we produce the evidence that supports uh, these kinds of things, or sometimes it doesn't, we learned that, you know, we were wrong. But in this clinical trial, we treated um, hundreds of patients with varying kinds of disorders, from panic disorder to obsessive compulsive disorder, et cetera, social anxiety disorder, uh, and depression. So we treated over 100 of them with the unified protocol, and then we treated over 100 of them with the specific protocols for panic disorder, social anxiety disorder, uh, generalized anxiety disorder, et cetera. And then we wanted to compare, you know, how do these, these things uh, stack up? And the result of this clinical trial, which we published a couple of years ago, showed that the unified protocol was just as good as the individual specific protocol. So for patients whose principal diagnosis was, say, panic disorder, but they might have also had comorbid disorders, the unified protocol did as well as the panic protocol that we had developed ourselves back in the 1980s. Yeah. The unified protocol was just as good. It wasn't better, but it wasn't worse. It was uh, it was called an equivalence trial. And the same was true for the other uh, diagnoses. And furthermore, the unified protocol had less attrition. So it was less dropout. Fewer people dropped out. Okay. We're not quite sure about wh why that happened, but that, that was an outcome. And then we've, uh, you know, we've also extended the application of the unified protocol to a very diverse population. So we have one trial that's fresh on my mind because it's just been finished and we've just submitted it. And uh, the lead uh, investigator was uh, Leonidas Castro Camacho from Bogota. And he was treating uh, his group at the uh, University of Los Andes, was treating uh, the victims of the uh, Civil War in Colombia, who suffered, uh, and one of the traumatic, uh, common traumatic events in that war was kidnapping. They would kidnap the victims. Uh, out in these rural areas and hold them for, for ransom. So now all these people, they've moved many of them in close to Bogota. And some of them are living near people who had kidnapped them. I mean, it's, a, it's still a very dangerous kind of situation. And they suffer, they suffer from intense emotional disorders. So Leonidas uh, adapted the unified protocol with the proper examples to fit the uh, victims of the Civil War using the proper examples and treated over 100 of them uh, and then compared that to the treatment as usual that they were getting in these various settlements uh, around Bogota and found the unified protocol proved to be you know, a very effective intervention for this specific group of uh, people suffering from PTSD and depression and anxiety, but clearly as a result of the uh, trauma of uh, kidnapping and, and the other consequences of the uh, Civil War. So that's a trial that uh, I think will attract uh, a lot of attention because it is such a different population. 
Yeah, and uh, I think uh, some some therapists, uh, particularly from the the behavior uh, analytic approach, may wonder: Does a unified protocol such as this leave room for an individualized uh, functional analysis of the of the client in order to to tailor the treatment? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, you know, that's a very good question. And it certainly does. In fact, a behavioral analysis is a necessary part of the unified protocol. Because in order to, uh, part of the unified protocol involves provoking the intense emotion. So then we have to find out, well, what are the cues that's eliciting the intense emotion? So we have to look carefully through a behavioral analysis, and that's part of the protocol. And then we use those uh, emotion-provoking situations to, in therapy itself, to uh, teach the patients new ways of coping. Yeah. So yes, it's a very important part of it. Great. And I, I just have a couple of, uh, two more questions. And uh, one of them is, uh, with the advent of this uh, transdiagnostic transdiagnostic approaches such as, as the UP or ACT and uh, functional analytic psychotherapy and well, some of these uh, some of these approaches and the identification of common uh, common processes among disorders and among treatments, uh, does it still make sense to keep uh, distinguishing uh, between diagnosis, for example, anxiety and depression, and uh, I don't know, uh, acute stress disorder? Yeah. <clears throat> well, that's, that's a question that's occupying some of the best minds in the world uh, in terms of what kind of a diagnostic system are we moving towards? Yeah. And the fundamental uh, uh, <clears throat> conflict here, if you like, or dialectic, is between a categorical system where we have specific disorders, as we do in the International Classification of Diseases or the DSM, on the one hand, and a dimensional system on the other where we sit we look at what are the key dimensions yeah. um, of psychopathology on which people may may differ. Uh, and so there's a lot of research now focusing on that very question. And clearly everybody agrees that we need to move more towards a dimensional yeah. system of classification. The difficult part is well what would that be? Yeah, and that's where people are having trouble agreeing. Yeah. And so, but that research uh, is continuing. But in the future, I think there's no question that we will see more and more uh, transdiagnostic, if you like, or dimensional approaches. Uh, we're, we're seeing it first in the personality disorders, where it's more advanced, because the cate categorical descriptions there are so unreliable, so poor. Yeah. Uh, we're seeing it first there, but I think we'll see it across the uh, spectrum. And there's various uh, efforts underway around the world. So there's the, the the National Institute of Mental Health in the States came up with what they call this RDOC. Yes. R-D-O-C. And, and that's a system whereby you rate various uh, psychopathology on dimensions and there's another one called the high top mm -hmm. H I C O P, and that's another system. So we'll see these systems, and then many of them will come up, and ultimately they'll combine, and maybe what you know we'll have some consensus on the way to do it. But that's years in the future. Yeah. Yeah. So you know how how best to disseminate some of these procedures. The, the, you know, I, I often in my lectures I go around and saying that developing new treatments is the easy part. You know, because we're doing it all, you know, in our center and with, you know, collaborators around the world. And we know the processes to accomplish that. And we just, uh, just 
The hard part is then disseminating the treatments, so spreading them out to the world so that, you know, therapists can make use of them. And, you know, a lot of that work is ongoing now. Uh, we call it dissemination and implementation research, or DNI. And uh, people are taking different approaches. So in uh, low-income countries, take Africa for an example, the African continent, uh, people are, are also attempting to boil down the modules or, or reduce you know, come to some common modules like the unified protocol or programs like it, you know, that can be delivered by um, people in the community who may not have advanced degrees, you know, a doctor's degree, for example, or even a uh, psychology degree. But they're known in the community as, as uh, maybe nurses or healers. And so, you know, there's a number of efforts around the world to train these people to deliver some of these basic principles, to increase the reach and disseminate better the uh, principles of psychological change that are based on evidence. So there's a lot of research like that, and, and it's a slow process, though. So. Yeah. Okay. So, Dr. Balu, thank you so much for for your time. I I really had a great time uh, talking to you and learning about so uh, well this work that you have been developing for for quite a few years now. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, it's been a pleasure, and thank you so much. For... Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, it's been very enjoyable to speak with you. Thank you. I'll I'll I'll. I'll leave here in the in the description of the video some of the links to to maybe your more uh, most recent books. I, I think uh, many of them have have been translated to Spanish, so I'll I'll leave the the translated versions here so people can go ahead and. Very good. All sounds great. Well, thanks so much. Have a great day. All right. Bye bye, Mauricio.